Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Deborah, would you come? All right. So we've got a mom that's going to share today. And uh, for those of you that don't know her, um, this is Deborah Avanellis. And uh, yeah, you can give her a hand. The, uh, the Avanellis family is just a, a tremendous blessing to our, our church family. Um, they actually lead um, heritage ministries here at Radiant Church that minister to orphans and adopting families and those children that are outside of family that they're brought in. And uh, that's an incredible ministry. And that just is a little reflection of their heart as believers in Jesus, that they actually want to see kids drawn into the kingdom and they want to see families thrive. And um, Gunnar also serves on our eldership team and and they are just an incredible blessing as a couple. And uh, we know that you're going to be blessed by her today. So thank you. Well, good morning. I am so excited to be here this morning. Um, Happy Mother's Day, moms. We made it. We got here. Everyone has clothes on. Everyone found their shoes. We're here. My kids actually aren't coming till second service, and it is a joy to not have to do that this morning. Uh, Yeah, sorry, Gun. I am so honored to be here this morning and to be able to share my heart and some of what God has taught me um, about motherhood, but about life in general. Um, I wanted to say to moms, like, good job laying down your life for the good of another. It's a big deal. And today I get to talk about laying down something else for the good of another, but also the good of ourselves. And that's idols. So Travis asked me to share about idol worship because I'm a little bit of an expert, unfortunately. (laughs) Um, And it started because um, during Holy Week, Travis had asked the elders and wives, where have you suffered with Christ and where have you found his resurrection life? And I was thinking, I'm not like a quick processor, so finding an answer on the spot's kind of hard for me sometimes. So all I could come up with was like, well, I suffered a breakdown, and some of the things that I held close got stripped away as God showed me a bunch of idols in my heart, and in his love and grace helped me get rid of them. And then I felt some life there. So does that count? (laughs) And apparently it counts because he's like, yes, let's share that with the whole church. Is it just me or something ringing? I have, I've had a plugged ear for a week and a half. And so I'm hearing a lot of sounds all the time ringing. So I don't know what's just my head and what's everyone's heads. Okay. Um, So anyway, it counts. So that's why I'm here, to share my idols, my failures, hopefully help you see some of yours, and then together for all of us to put our eyes back on God, to lay down our idols together, and to seek the only one who's really worthy of our worship. So I think we can all agree that we want to live in right relationship with God. Like nobody wakes up one day like, I know it'd be great if I could just worship some idols and have distance between me and God. Like nobody does that, right? We want to worship God. We want to be close to God. But sometimes it's just so hard. And sometimes things feel distant and frustrated. And I'm like, why? I'm supposed to be a good, mature Christian. How do I have so much junk? 
But God is gracious and good, and he knows the best thing for us is himself. And so he's willing to show us all the places where we're exalting other things so that we can grab them, throw them down. Whoa, sorry. Don't worry. Okay. Don't worry, I'm right here. Thanks. I knew for sure that wasn't outside of my head, not just in my ear. Check one, check two. Fashion, 1970s chord. I feel that. Hello? Hello? Can we hear me? Okay. Right there? All right. I feel like I'm going to sing a song, and you guys do not want that. <clears throat> no. All right. Where were we at? Let's regroup here. I feel like I'm at home with all my kids. Um, all right. So... Why can it be so frustrating? Why do we feel like we're distant? Is there maybe something in the way? Perhaps. So let's, let's review some questions together. <laughs> what do we love and what motivates us? What are we most proud of and how do we protect it? What do we orient our lives around? What do we want to never change? What are our ideals? What are our idols? I think um, we should probably figure it out because the Bible gives a pretty clear warning in Psalm 106, 36, saying they served their idols, which became a snare to them. I think we all know that an idol is an image or a representation of God used as an object of worship. And sometimes there are tangible things or things that are really easy to identify, like power or money or stuff. Um, but other times they're not as easy to see because they're good things, gifts that God has given us, like our family or our comfort or our work or even our service. If I worship the gift over the giver, I've made an idol. It will be empty yet heavy and overbearing because we have to prop it up and hold it secure. It was never meant to bear the weight of our attention and affection and expectation. Only God can do that. I accidentally bought a book on the Ten Commandments a few weeks ago. I, I bought the book on purpose, but I didn't know it was about the Ten Commandments. But my favorite author, Jen Wilkin, was sharing that her new book was coming out. And I was like, I'm pre-ordering that. I need that book. I love everything she writes because she always helps me see God clearly. And like, it helps everything else fade away. So I was like, Jen Wilkin wrote a book. I'm buying it. But then I got it and I was like, oh, the Ten Commandments, huh? Okay. Um, but as God would have it, in his goodness and in his timing, I opened up the book, and the first commandment is, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment. Okay, let's all review. You shall have no other gods before me. Okay, that's in Exodus 20, verse 3, in case you need a refresher there. Anyway, what Wilkin does... Um, is she explains why the Israelites were even being called to that in the first place. Because before they even went to Egypt, she told Jacob, who would later be called Israel, you and your family need to get rid of all of your foreign gods. And she says that the presence of idols among Jacob's family points to the operation of a both-and mentality. We will serve Yahweh, but also, just in case, we will offer our devotion to these other gods as well. We are just as prone to add an idol. Just like them, we don't typically cease the worship of God entirely, but we do often cease the worship of God alone. So, what idols are you adding? There's a good chance I'm going to step on toes here, so you just get your toes ready. Are we maybe worshiping harmony and peace? Being good and right? Maybe like me, people-pleasing or wanting people's approval? Maybe it's being admired or successful, or maybe you are someone who likes power and money. Um, perhaps it's being unique and authentic or 
competent and self-sufficient. Maybe you're worshiping or adding some safety and security or fun and autonomy. Or perhaps for you, it's like strength and justice. Notice most of these are characteristics of God, and that's why we desire them, because we were made to desire God. But if we look for satisfaction in anything apart from God or more than God, then we'll never be truly satisfied. We gravitate towards idols because we know we can't control God, but we can kind of control some of these other things. Or maybe more accurately, we've distorted his image into something of our own making. Whatever we exalt above God will always come down. God doesn't compete, and he will give us the chance to acknowledge them and lay them down, or he will straight knock them down. I love the story in 1 Samuel 5, verses 1 through 4. It's when the Philistines, um, a nation that was against the nation of God, they captured the Ark of God, which is where the presence of God dwelt, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant into their temple with their idol, Dagon. And the next morning they woke up, and Dagon was face down in front of the Ark of God. And they were like, oh, no, let's get this back up. So they, like, push him back up, prop him back in his place. They're like, that's okay. We could put it back up. He's fine. Guess what happened the next morning? Dagon's on his face again, and his head's cut off. And his hands, too. Like, God was like, nope, we don't compete here. God will not compete. He will always bring our idols down. He does not tolerate them. But he doesn't do it because he's mean. He does it because he loves us and because he wants what's best for us. Just like I don't want my kids to eat a bunch of junk food before I have a healthy meal to feed them or like watch a bunch of TV and numb their brains to the truth of God. God doesn't want us worshiping idols that are going to leave us empty and disappointed and frustrated. They're like empty calories when we're like starving for spiritual nutrients. We need God alone. So I can tell you about my idols because I've recognized them oftentimes. And I try so hard to like lay them down again. But just like those dang Philistines, I'm like propping them up again. And I don't mean to, but I've added idols of comfort and ease and control I've propped up idols of people pleasing and impressing, and every time it's been to my detriment. I've loved comfort too much that I've resisted change, even good, healthy change. I've loved it so much that I've avoided conflict, afraid to speak up sometimes when I should have because of what people thought of me. Have you ever done that? Or maybe you've been afraid to take a step of faith because you really like how comfortable life is right now and you're afraid of what God will tell you to do if you really surrender. Or maybe we've had these ideas or ideals of what life should be and when they don't happen, we blame God or get mad at him. When we do that, we've worshiped our ideal and really ourselves over God. In that, we're saying like, I know more, and I deserve more, and God is withholding from me. He's not giving us his best. Letting go of that is hard, but it's not impossible. We certainly have to grieve. We have to grieve when we feel that loss or when we feel that disappointment. But we don't have to live there. We can keep following him because God has taught me in his word that I have to let him lead even in the most uncomfortable places. Many times over, the spirit has helped me see that comfort makes me more self-sufficient and less God-dependent. And this can cause distance between me and God because when I'm in that place of self-sufficiency, my pride grows and with it, guilt and shame Because just like Adam and Eve, I'm prone to like run away and hide when I know what I'm doing is wrong. And so over the last few years, God's given me opportunities to address these idols. If not, we would have never considered fostering and adopting. We were exchanging a lot of what was comfortable and familiar and 
mostly predictable for a lot of unknown and a lot of change. But because God is gracious in laying down these idols, he allowed us to seek him more fully. We grew in trust of him and his power as we laid down our lives and preferences and predictable comfort for the good of two precious kids. There's certainly been ups and downs, more chaos and conflict than I would have ever chosen for myself. But also in it, we have known the faithfulness of God in a deeper way than we've ever known before. He's come near multiple times to meet us, to teach us, to hold us up when it felt like we were empty. God gives us himself when we're willing to lay down anything that we're holding higher than him. And I think it's because when we walk in obedience, it's easier to want to be near God. And so it's easier to ask him to be near. So even though I've had time recognizing idols and giving them to God, he used this pandemic to graciously show me more. (sighs) Ones I hadn't seen and ones I'd thought I already toppled, but somehow had been pulling back up again. It was hard and it hurt and I hated it. For those of you who know me, you know I'm an extreme extrovert. I love people, all the people. Like when I'm having a bad day, I'm like, if I can just be around my friends, I know everything will be better. Not even my friends, just adults. If I can just be around other humans, this day will get better. Um, and so because of that, we, we live a pretty busy life. We have like a lot of things going on. Um, we have people over for dinner and play dates with the kids. And like, like I love my kids. They're great. Those of you who know them, they're so precious, right? But they're also like, um, what's the word? (laughs) They're a little draining. (laughs) Because, like, they have a lot to say and they have a lot to ask and they, like, question my competence a lot and that's really hard. So that's why I like people and being around other people, right? So I can feel like I'm appreciated. Anyway, all that to say, we used to have a pretty full schedule. It was all color-coded on my calendar because I'm like that. Um, And so when the pandemic sent us home and canceled everything, I could no longer hold on to my plans or my predictability or autonomy or control. Um, And all my color-coded fun vanished. And it was sad, like in so many ways. Like, going from color-coded page after page to just blank, empty page. Um, Much of my activity and energy and the things I look to to bring me life vanished. And I'm I'm sure I'm not the only one. All the extroverts are like, yes, mm mm-hmm, amen, yes. But even the most introverted among us couldn't fully love it because nobody loves being told what to do all the time. Ask my kids. Um... (sighs) Sorry. (laughs) That wasn't in my notes. I just keep referring to them. Just came out. Um, I like following rules for the most part. Like, I'm a rule follower. But when they're, like, hard to understand or, like, it feels like they're being made by incompetent parties, I kind of turn into my kids and start questioning everyone and everything, right? Like, whoa. Um, So anyway... As this pandemic kept going, and as they took my idols of, like, all my stuff, I started to get a little angry. Did anyone else feel angry? Did you know that anger is usually the outward manifestation of fear? What makes you angry? What are you afraid of losing? Is it maybe becoming an idol? So I knew God was doing something in the world, and I was sure he wanted to do something in me. Um, And things got, like, real, real at the end of April 2020. I, like, have this vivid memory of it all. I was in the boys' room. I was putting books on the shelf for, like, I don't know, the 3,000th time that day. Because somehow 
praise the Lord, they love to read, but nobody likes to put a book away in our house. So I'm putting books away again. There's like Legos all over the floor. I've asked for like, hey, come in here. Come help me, guys. Someone has pooped their pants again. People are fighting. Someone's asking a million questions. And all of a sudden, like, I was just like, I can't do this anymore. Why? Why won't anybody listen to me? Why? Why? And I ended up like in the fetal position, rocking back and forth, just kind of like whispering. I think it started at a yell, but it ended up at a whisper like, why? Why won't anybody listen to me? And it was enough to concern Gunner. And he got me up and he put me in bed. I don't even know what he did with the kids the rest of that day. It was early afternoon, too. It was an early time for a breakdown, but that's what it was. Like, I just, I couldn't do this anymore. And so when I woke up the next day, Gun was like, I've booked you a hotel. And you're going away for two nights. And I felt so loved. Because I couldn't do it anymore. It was too much. And I love that he saw that. And he loved me enough to be like, you're not okay, and we're not okay if you're not okay. So you go away. And God met me there in that solitude. With no people or demands or distractions, I had to sit by myself and be honest about my frayed nerves and my fragile heart. And God reminded me of his word, like, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I was a little annoyed because I'm like, the heck, man? Like, what have I been doing this last month and a half locked in this house? I've been asking you for help. I'm trying to give you all of these things. But these people are relentless. And they don't listen. Like, I'm doing the best I can, God. But, like, what the heck? And so he spoke to me. In a picture, which is weird because I almost never hear God in pictures. And honestly, sometimes I'm like a little skeptical of them. But like as I was praying and just pouring out my heart and being super honest with him, I felt like I saw this pack mule coming out of a trail like at the Grand Canyon type of thing. And I'm like, what the heck? But I felt like God said, you are a beast of burden, but you're carrying weight I didn't give you, weight that is too heavy for your frame. And in that place, I felt the love of God as he helped me see that in trying to control my kids and my circumstances and trying to hold tight to comfort and security and familiarity, I didn't have the strength much less the capacity to hold on to him and him alone. I'm so thankful for that suffering that led to life. He was teaching me how to let go of things that I can't control, that I was never meant to control and hold on to him. And because God is gracious and the pandemic kept going, there was more. I had to go back home and bless, bless my kids. Guys, they were just like, mommy, we love you. We're going to listen to you. (laughs) And it lasted for like a day. (laughs) But like, so did I. I'm like, God, I'm home. I'm going to listen to you. And it lasted for like a week or the best I could, you know. So as summer came and there was like a lot of social unrest and social media movements, I started to contemplate my place and identity. I'm a woman of Mexican descent who loves American history. Don't always love the history that happened, but I do love knowing it and learning it. I think because my grandparents were immigrants, 
and my parents lived at a, a low poverty level. Then I married into another family that's completely different from what I grew up in. I, I have a heart for people all across the spectrum. And I feel like I can empathize in a way that not everybody can. So in that, in that I wanted to know, I wanted people to know that I cared. I cared about everyone who was hurting, those I agreed with and those I didn't, those I knew and those I didn't. Like, I I care for you, and I want you to know that. And I want everyone to know how much I care and how good and kind I am. (laughs) And why do I want you to all know that? Because I care what people think of me more than I care about God sometimes, darn it. Like, once again, these good things. This is good to care and to empathize. But I'm caring about it more and lifting it up higher and not even recognizing it, really, because it goes at just such a slow spot or such a slow pace. You don't recognize when these good things you're holding are passing God in your heart. So... There we are. There's my idol again, caring more about what people thought of me than Christ and his opinion of me. Another thing I don't mean to be so proud of and self-righteous of is my family. For those of you who don't know, I married Gunner, a white man, a wonderful, competent, God-fearing man. He's, guys, he's amazing. He's just such a gift from God. And then my brother married a Mexican girl. She's so lovely. And my sister married a black Filipino man. He's awesome. We're like the United Nations. (laughs) Or like a picture of heaven, I like to think every nation and tongue, or at least most continents, represented worshiping God together. And... I get really proud of us because look at how great we are. Maybe the world would be better if there were more people, more families as diverse as us worshiping God. And there's my idol, the thing that I want to hold on to and never change. I want it to always be good and beautiful and shiny. Nobody mess it up. Family is good. Unity is good. If I worship it, it doesn't cease to be good, but it does compete with God, and we've already established he does not compete. So, over this last year, we've had some awkward conversations. In my attempt to show my concern, I offended people, offended my family. We've had some distance in relationships that we've not had before, and I hated it and I couldn't fix it, and had some distance with God, hated that more. So how do we battle that? How do we fight the lies and idols that we've held onto? We do it by worshiping God and putting our eyes and our heart and our attention and affection back on the only one who's really worth it. I find comfort in the word of God. There's nothing new under the sun. I'm not the first to worship idols. I'm not going to be the last. I'm not the first to worship my family, my culture, my heritage, my past, and by doing so, offend God. So I thought of Paul. He could have taken a lot of pride in who he was or where he came from. And before his life-changing encounter with Jesus, he did. In chapter 3 of Philippians, he's warning the Philippians of those who are putting their confidence and focus on things other than Jesus. And he goes into detail to explain why his family heritage and tradition and culture gave him reason to boast so confidently. But in verse 7, so if you want to turn with me, Philippians 3, verse 7, he says, But whatever gain I had... I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and counted them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
or in my case, my family, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul's example of killing an idol and letting anything that has taken position over the authority of God be put back in its right place is good for us. It's likely going to hurt and be hard. There will need to be humility, repentance, a death to some of the things, the thoughts, the ideas, the idols we were holding on to. In order to worship God alone and have no other gods or idols, we have to be honest with what tempts to take our attention and affection. Like Paul, we have to die to those earthly desires and be raised to life in Christ. So I'm trying to bury my idols. I'm trying to put them back in my right place. And in it, I'm finding life. I want to surrender control and learn to live open-handed again. His plans, not mine. His timing, not mine. His control over my life and family, not mine. Will the... I probably still battle this. Yes. Will I have to keep checking my heart? Yes. Because we've already seen how often we, all of us humans, from back in Philistine times till now, we tend to prop things back up. But just like Paul in verses 12 through 14, I want to be able to say, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Do you want to press on? We can overcome. We don't have to be bound by our, by our idols anymore. We can repent and come near. I'm finding freedom and beauty in the slower pace. I'm In dying to my desire for more people, interaction, and approval, God has helped me see that often I would use it as a distraction from addressing the deeper things in my heart. As I get better at recognizing these idols, I'm going to have to fight to keep them down and not keep propping them up. We were made to worship, and we need God's help to worship him well. God wants to be our only God, so he will keep helping us. When we worship ourselves and our idols, it's destructive, but he has compassion for us. Remember the warning in Psalm 106, 36, they worshiped their idols and it became a snare to them. It goes on to describe the discipline God gave them for that idol worship. But in verses 44 and 45, it says, Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. So in that gracious love, he reveals our idols so we can kill them and bury them and find his resurrection life. But how do we kill idols that we've made of people? We repent and we say sorry. We put them back in their rightful place, acknowledging what's true. They are a gift from God and we are to love and serve them well, but we are not to let them have the weight of our worship. For me, that means acknowledging that my family is like any other normal family. Maybe we should avoid politics and conversation for a while. And the best I can do is humble myself and say sorry when I need to and listen in love. And then what they do with my apology is between them and God. It means I don't have to take my kids' behavior personally. And that as long as I'm faithful to surrender to God and try my best, I can rest in him. I cannot control them. That is not my weight to bear. So back to the beginning. Are we worshiping God alone or have idols joined the party? How are they treating us? Are we feeling fulfilled or dissatisfied? Are we feeling close to God or distant? Ours may not be as obvious as the golden calf that the Israelites made, 
when they were worshiping and God gave them Ten Commandments. But as we identify ours, may we also see what they really are in comparison to God. As Jen Wilkins so wonderfully compares the calf to God, she says, it is small, but God is immense. It is inanimate, but God is spirit. It is location bound, but God is everywhere, fully present. It is created, but God is uncreated. It is new, but God is eternal. It is impotent. It has no power, but God is omnipotent. It is destructible, but God is indestructible. It is blind, deaf, and mute, but God sees, hears, and speaks. What is he speaking to you right now? We often worship idols because we forget the truth about who God is, or we've believed lies about him. So let's remember who he is. Psalm 103, verses 3 through 6 and verse 8 remind us that he's the one who forgives all all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. This is our God. Let's repent of worshiping idols that dissatisfy and fail. Let's put them to death and come to life. Let's worship God alone. So with that, worship team, would you come up? Guys, we get to take a few minutes right now. Let's not leave the same way we came. If God has highlighted one of your idols, let's confess and repent that right now. God is so gracious. He doesn't make us like pay for our sins. We get to hand them over right now. If there's someone next to you that you want to confess to, let's do it. Let's get rid of it. Even if you don't want to do it, let's do it and get rid of it. God, thank you that you love us. You love us so much that you don't want us to just stay distant or frustrated. You love us enough, God, that you draw us near and that you want to remove every sin that entangles us and distracts us and trips us up, God. Jesus, we're going to take a minute right now and we're going to confess our idols and we're going to repent. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantbicelia.com. Until next time.